Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is episode 433. This is our roundtable show that we record on Fridays at 8.30 Pacific Standard Time, almost every Friday. Uh, um, basically, we've got a great panel. I think I've rustled up some reasonable stories. The panel were bitching as normal about the quality of stories, but just blame it on me, beloved listeners and viewers. There we go. But we've got a strong panel. Um, I'm going to let my friend John Locke introduce himself. John, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Yeah, John Locke, SEO practitioner, helping manufacturing firms build empires. And I've got my great co-host, Adrian. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Adrian. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the CEO and founder of Groundhog. We build marketing, automation, and sales tools for businesses that use WordPress. And um, oh, keeps, um, Spencer keeps disappearing. He's got computer troubles, listeners and viewers. Um, we've got Chris, Chris Badgett. Would you like to introduce yourself, Chris? Yes, I'm Chris Badgett from Lifter LMS, and I help course creators grow and scale. Right. And I've got Sally. Sally, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Sally Getch, the WP fangirl, and I um, do not personally wish to grow myself or scale myself at all. I am about the right size. Um, <laughs> but uh, if I were teaching courses, I would want Chris to help me scale those. Uh, yes, I think you would. And I've got Joe. Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Joe Casabona. I am a podcaster, educator, and developer uh, in that order reverse chronologically. Uh, yes. And I, I help people with WordPress. You certainly do. And I've got my uncle, Uncle Spencer. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Spencer Foreman from WP Launchify. You need to increase your volume a little bit, Spencer. Spencer Foreman from WP Launchify. Oh, yes, that's better. Uh, um, <laughs> God. Um, I'll just talk, oh, before we go into my stories, I must mention one of my great sponsors. And uh, that's Breezy, breezy.co. And they're a page builder, but They've got some unique technology and also the actual page builder is pretty interesting. Um, it's got a really slick UX design. I think it's got one of the best UX designs in the market. It's a competitive market, but I think Breezy will impress you. So go over to Breezy.com, try it out, give me some feedback. I love some feedback, what you think about Breezy. I think it's marvellous. Like I say, go over to Breezy, try it out. So basically, we're going to go into the stories. Um, Gaz, oh, how do you pronounce it? Gatsby. Gatsby. Gatsby raises. Gatsby, as in the Gats, great Gatsby. Great Gatsby. Um, Gatsby raises 15 million plans to invest more heavily in WordPress and CMS integration. And then we had another um, story from TechCrunch. Uh, about another page builder. Um, do how do you pronounce that? Do they? Do da? Do da? Do da. Where the freaking hell do they get these names from? This is what I want to know. I'm going to start with Uncle Spencer. Well, what I what, what I really want to know is whether Duda means like something rude in Hebrew. Um, oh, it's another Israeli company, is it? Oh no, don't reply. Uh, um, off you go, Spencer. What did you think of these two stories? I just thought I find it interesting that TechCrunch doesn't have a link that works in the article head of Duda. And when you scroll down, the Duda link is not hyperlinked. It's dark black. So you have to like literally know to click to get to the company. I find that's interesting when you talk about a company as far as a publication. Well, and it doesn't, it doesn't link to their website. It links to Crunchbase. Right. But even then, you know, it's just, thought that it's just odd to me that a publication doesn't give a link in the article to the actual company that they're talking about taking money. That's just a, a weird way to do publication stuff. Um, the, the difference between these two companies is the Gatsby is an accessory that is designed to help people build stuff with the WordPress core and all, you know, in a different way, right? We talked about Gatsby in the past. It is not trying to be a platform. <laughs> Duda, if I have not misread it, is trying to essentially be a platform and i.e. a competitor of the CMS of WordPress. Uh, I have yapped about my history in the past, but way back in another decade and another century and so forth, I went through the process of being a person who writes stuff or my partner wrote stuff and I promoted stuff that was an accessory to a small platform. 
And just like we bitch every day here when we're on the show about how WordPress does this, WordPress does that, the thing that stops it from being like a problem is that it's open source. So we can bitch and moan, but we can still do anything we want. When you go on a closed small platform, it's like asking your ex-wife or husband for a favor. Good luck. And 50 million bucks to make a competitor of something that is a third of the internet and then try to get all the independent people to participate when it's a little closed circle of like ex-spouses running the show, good luck. For the same reasons that we complain about why WordPress and Automatic with its shoe scope is matte with auto and... <laughs> oh, you done it, you done it. I'll give you a full box. We what, mentioned, what's this, what's we mentioned auto. Right We've got to mention auto every episode, don't we? The well, henchman I mean, you know, hench of automatic. You bring it in because here's what the whole point of it is, is that it's nice that there's a company trying to do something cool. I think it's a no brainer for a company to build an accessory service like the Gatsby, because that's a cool thing. It's different. It's an accessory. It's complimentary to try to go against WordPress with a closed platform. The problem is not, should you do it? The problem is if you do it, 50 million bucks is not even going to scratch the surface because your bigger problem is how to get the tens of millions of people from WordPress to come over and convince them that it's safe to be there. And I don't see how that's possible with 50 million bucks and a small team of people making all the decisions on a closed platform. Yeah, I better men mention WP Fusion before you do. Yeah, go, go use WP Fusion. There we go. I thought I'd do it for you, Spencer. Uh, um, on to the next. <laughs> I don't know. So, <laughs> what, is the beef with, what is the beef with WP Fusion? They, they were a very nice sponsor of the show. I don't know. No, I'm just thinking the Vicky. Yeah, yeah, I love Jack and I love WP Fusion. They're yes. Crazy. Well, uh, there's a, a couple of points on what Spencer said. One, you can build a website with Gatsby without using WordPress. I think one of the interesting things, or, or anything else, is that they are you know, choosing to go into, go down the pathway of saying, if you like your CMS, you don't have to replace your CMS with us, but you can use us to publish from your CMS to other places or in a different way or create something that's, you know, going to be faster or, and whatever. Um, and Duda is going down the route of, uh, you know, uh, we want you to replace your existing CMS with us because we think your CMS sucks. And, um, you know, it was we all have... about React, though. I mean, it was all about the interface using React versus using PHP, HTML, and so forth. That was the big allure. And I think that's the compelling feature, right? I mean, I, I understand that basically, yes, the JavaScriptiness is the is the point of Gatsby and, and that it is, you know, performance. I mean, like JavaScript by itself does not give you performance, right? So we've seen lots of evidence of, of sites that use a lot of JavaScript being hella slow. Um, because they're using it the wrong way for the wrong things. Um, but I, yeah, that Gatsby can let you, you know, create a site that is not going to have the, uh, you know, the, the sluggish database interaction in the same way of, uh, that it would if you just use the, the WordPress uh, front end. Now, you know, I think there are various companies basically presenting themselves as having, you know, advantages WordPress doesn't and disadvantage it, you know, and, and, and not having certain of the disadvantages of WordPress, every system will have its own disadvantages. And, um, it, you know, they have to start somewhere. I'm glad that there's competition for WordPress yeah. and that it's getting attention because if we don't have competition, if WordPress mm -hmm. truly dominates the market to the point where all of those people investing money in, in automatic, um, you know, seem to need it to be if they're going to get their money back, you end up with complacency. And we end up where Microsoft was uh, a while ago, where, you know, there was so much market dominance that there's absolutely no incentive uh, to make any improvements. Do you think that that's really a possibility, though? Because I, I fall back on the one difference, which is all the other examples of monopolistic behavior stem from it being a closed platform, whereas here we have the ultimate linchpin. We have the Achilles heel, which is we own access to the code. So if they ever acted as bad, well, if they were ever bad actors, to the extent that people wanted to leave, then we pursue the thing that was already alluded to, you know, and started, which was everybody goes this direction and automatic builds their own commercial version of it. and calls Well, it it, I mean, it means that people are not left in the lurch in the same way. And, and Gatsby also is open source, which, you know, which, which Duda is not. Um, 
and uh, you know i'm in favor of of open source uh, but uh, you know i think people would suffer uh, if there was not you know because well our you know i am not going to be the one who forks wordpress and like you know uh, and continues to expand and, and up, update the core. I don't have that skill. I just look forward to the YouTube adverts every time you put in something for WordPress. They'll be like Wix, won't they? Every time you look for something, you get a freaky Wix advert. Yes. Just, has any of the other panel got anything to say about this? Because you're looking a little bit bored. Or shall I go on to story two? Oh, I'll, I'll just I'll, say this. Duda yeah. looks like it's it's basically a, a Squarespace Wix type thing mm. that um, it's it's not for like enterprise level stuff. It's like if if yeah. you're an agency and mostly what you churn out is uh, basic marketing or basic business sites, and that's what this is. Yeah, Adrian, you had something you want to say? No, I no. want to go to story two. All right, I will. Sorry, I took you right. On, on to a juicy one here, folks. WeWork um, gave founder loans as it paid him rent. IPO filing shows. It shows a lot of other stuff. So, Adrian, do you want to start this one off? Okay, 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 okay. Oh, I've jumped, been, I've jumped been, up with that. Yeah, twist, twist his arm. I've been, I've been following this whole story since they had originally got their private $47 billion valuation from SoftBank, okay? A $47 billion valuation on a company that claimed it was a tech company but never had any technology to actually show anybody, ever. Like, it doesn't except for, like, maybe the website, I guess. But essentially, if you're not familiar with what WeWork is, co-working or shared workspaces are extremely popular these days for people who are freelancers or they're work from home people and there's no physical location for them to go work so they can go rent for $500 a month, a shared desk, which is basically a plastic chair and a table in a place where a whole bunch of other people are supposedly or supposed to be renting a shared table and a plastic chair for $500 a month. was definitely somebody renting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh. So their, their basic business plan is to, is to, for the next 10 years, they have $47 billion in lease commitments over the next 10 years, okay? Without owning any of the actual physical space that they're renting, except for a handful of buildings, uh, and they can't prove that they're actually able to keep the short-term leases of that $500 a month in order to actually cover the cost of renting the facility as a whole. So what, what they've done is they've basically gone and they, they, they represent 5% of all commercial real estate leases in New York City alone, which is like 5.3 million square feet or something in New York City as of last, and that's last year. So all like 5% of all commercial leasing happened because of this company. And they just, they, they, they can't back it up with, with the actual things because they're profitable competitors that actually exist that trade around the, the three, four billion dollars mark on, on, on the stock exchange, uh, have smaller spaces, uh, charge higher revenues. And, you know, they provide a more kind of like VIP experience with actual, you know, comfy chairs and comfy desks. Uh, so, so they've been parading around as this tech company to explain their explosive growth because they've. Uh, the actual size of their operation has exploded tremendously over the years. And they've been, they've been going to SoftBank and they've been collecting like up to, I think they've collected $13 billion so far in funding based on the idea that they can actually accommodate that explosive growth because they are a tech company, much like how Uber and Lyft quantify. But Silicon their- Valley loves companies company. that are losing money. Pardon? Yeah. I said, but Silicon Valley loves companies that are losing money. So, yes, but it's not a Silicon Uber Valley company Lyft. because it's not a tech company because yeah. their business is real estate and not even real estate because they don't uh, own any. You're, it's you're, you're, real estate. You're, you're too cynical, Adrian. You know, it's all about the spin, mate. Um, it's, all about com- it's all about comfy chairs. Um, Chris. But they don't have comfy chairs. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, I can say it's all about the comfy chairs. Chris, how... how Got any insight how the, how this founder and this crowd managed to achieve this total yes. Ponzi scheme? Basically? Yeah, I, so I just have a cautionary ch- tale for the more um, bootstrapped entrepreneur who has a product or an agency. 
Uh, and, and this is not tax advice or legal advice. Um, so it's been harder recently in the United States to get what's known as the home office exemption. And I see more and more entrepreneurs who work from home. Uh, they, they are renting out their house or part of their house to their company. And this is where the problem starts. As you're like, you start thinking about how can I funnel this expense to the business and create a tax advantage here? What we're looking at is this issue at scale. Like, so you just have to be very careful and keep your head on straight, keep your ethics on straight and uh, get uh, professional legal and tax advice before you create a monstrosity of um, uh, just where you can, this thing can spiral out of control. So just be careful and how your business interacts with you personally. Contextualization for Chris's comment. Uh, if you didn't hear the article of the, of, or the article originally, uh, the CEO, Adam Newman, borrowed up to like, I think $700 million from, uh, from WeWork, his company, as well as an additional $30 million from uh, JP Morgan and used that money. Uh, and, well, JP Morgan was actually to finance the mortgages on the properties that he bought using the company's money and then leased the space that he now personally owns back to WeWork. It's just been creative. Just let you be too cynical. Um, Spencer, well, it's, it's it's highly creative, but the you know the thing that worries me fraudulent is fraudulent is the more the word I'm looking for here. No, we, yes, there as, is as no in, truth you know, now. There's, creative there's, creative there's, accounting. Um, but the thing that worries me is that WeWork owns Meetup.com. Yeah, that sounds great. They, Uncle Spencer, it's, it's kind of like it seems like a separate world. These people in Wall Street and Silicon Valley, it, the normal rules of life doesn't doesn't seem to apply to these people at all. It, it, these figures, it's, ten, it's like ten dollars is ten million, twenty bucks is thirty million. What's going on, Uncle Spencer? Well, it's like it's like behind the music. Those old those video, ser video series used to be a thing on eight, VH1 or MTV where it would talk about like the rise of rock and roll star and so forth. When people are in the Silicon Valley world, for sure, they're in a bubble. That's the words it's used. But like the, the mindset is that there's only one way to succeed by being huge enough that you get the attention of the people with the money. So the stories get inflated, the numbers get inflated, the motives get distracted and people do weird stuff. In this particular case, I think the liability falls on SoftBank, the primary investor, because they're also the investor in what I think is a legit company that will, of course, kill us all, which is the Boston Dynamics. Oh, I've got but things they, to say about that as well. Good. They have so much money in so many places that these outrageous concepts of like a dude borrowing money to buy the building and then leasing them back could miss being noticed for some time. But a lot of these end badly. Like, for example, there was the uh, the testing company. I forget the name of the... the oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I forgot. Theranos. 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 Thanos, right? The blood yeah. test. Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> yes, then Theranos, there was, but yes. Thanatos might be better. There was Color, remember? That was the software company a few years ago that was going to be like the next trillion dollar thing and they blew through a million billion dollars and then the guy just said, oh, it doesn't work and walked away. I mean, there's a lot of skyrocketing things that come crashing down fast. And I think this Adam guy is due for a lot of hurt because there's going to be people going after him personally for what he did. I mean, there's no way he's going to get away with this unless the company ends up actually making billions of dollars. Somebody's going to come after him with a, you know, like a, a bill on receipt. The, well, you, well, he sold, well, they've already he booted him out, right? Wii trademark to he sold the we trademark. He went personally trademarked the word we, and then sold it to his own company for six million dollars. But you gotta you understand the lit, the litigation part of this. My old life, my old world. See, if you if you sow these sort of ill contended situations, it's one thing to take money, suck it up, admit to the investors, I did a bad job, but I did it honestly. The investors are big boys and girls. In this case, he was just a thief and he did dishonest things. And I can say that from just the patent facts. So in this case, what'll happen is the investors who lose their money will find the right attorneys who will pursue shareholder action against him individually to get his assets and the other stuff that he basically ripped them off for. 
Now, the guy who runs SoftBank has bigger issues too, because as I understand, the reason this whole thing came tumbling down was because he had some problems of his own and he couldn't come through with the $47 billion that he had promised. And then they had to change the whole evaluation, which sort of shone a light on, wait, what's really going on here? And that's when everything became a problem. Well, so that's, you know. so what actually, so what happened was they filed for their S1 at their $47 billion, their, their $47 billion uh, valuation to go IPO. And then everybody started looking to the S1 file and started seeing all of the, all of the stuff going on, all of the financials, all of the misgivings of, of Adam Newman. And then they went from their $47 billion valuation at the beginning of last week. And then on Friday, under 10 billion. Right. And they, the they haven't IPO'd yet. Look at the Saddlers in the oxycodone situation. They were kings and queens of the world. And then all of a sudden it became just clear to everybody, wait, they're creating addicts and then selling the solution for addicts. Wait, what's going on? And then they had to go bankrupt and they got busted trying to move their money offshore into Swiss bank accounts. They're going to prison too. Like we love in America creating heroes and tearing down people from the top. And that's just what's going to happen. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to let um, John in this one. What, what do you reckon, John? This geezer, he's a bit of a dicey, dicey geezer, isn't he? Yeah, he's, a, he's another narcissist. Um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. He, he wanted to uh, be a trillionaire, uh, uh, want, you know, wanted to be president of, of uh, Earth, something. go live on Mars with the rest of... Uh, oh, he wants to live with our friendly Amazon, yeah, Dr. He, Evil. Basically yeah, like the real life fucker. Elysium, Atlas Shrug type of guy, you know. I, you know they're, I, all, I, they're all planning to go to Mars, aren't they, John? Oh, yeah, this, this planet's toast and that's why they're trying to go but anyway yeah i you know hopefully he'll he'll get what he deserves i mean as far as that you know you can do a lot of things in this country but don't mess with people's money because that's yeah, when think, you get, that's is, when you get think, punished i think he's gonna lose his balls actually i think someone's gonna cut his balls off actually. especially if he goes to chicago they freaking use it for a rusty pair of pliers probably uh um <laughs> on to the next story um Oh, God. Oh, shit. We've got some good stories here. Good, good shit here. At uh, the end of Jigo Shop, what happened to the once popular e-commerce WordPress? Well, one word. WooCommerce, isn't it? Uh, uh, fuck. Well, um, Joe, what do you reckon about this one? I think this story <laughs> is a fine piece of journalism that we don't often see in the WordPress space. Um, I like that uh, Delicious Brains, specifically uh, Ian... Ian? I'm saying that right, right? That's not like an L, but like a bad typeface. Uh, Ian Paulson, uh, I think he went deep on this, and I really appreciate that. Um, as for what happened, if, if you're not familiar with the Jigo Shop uh, storyline, um, they were a popular e-commerce plugin for WordPress, uh, and then, you know, yada, 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 WooCommerce forked it, uh, and it became WooCommerce, and then Automatic bought WooCommerce. I yada yada over some pretty important parts there, but I do, the it, all the time. I do it all yeah. the time, Joe. Yeah. yeah, the the general idea is that uh, is that yeah, 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 yeah. WooCommerce is a fork of Jigo Shop that then became bigger than Jigo Shop, and uh, Jigo Shop seems to have completely disappeared. Um, the website. Yeah, but down. I, think, I think the key thing about this, apart from the history, which yeah. we have talked about to some extent, is you know if a if a plugin which is used by a reasonable large, what is the sure. what is what is the proper way to if it if it's time to call it a day, what's the proper way? of dealing with it. And I, I think the way they've dealt with it is definitely <laughs> just, not the proper yeah, way of dealing with it. Just straight up disappearing is just not the proper way. The it's the like, you can't, yeah. you can't just ghost. I mean, you can, you, he, well, they've, they've done did. it. Um, but you know, I don't know. I'm not a Jago shop user. Um, there seems to be no uh, no comment from them. Their site is just gone. The plugin is still in the. And I always, um, I'm always amazed, you know, when I get clients say, "Well, I found this plugin. Can you install it for?" And you go to the website. There's no address on the website. There's no information on the company website. Who's behind this frigging thing? When you when you try and find out who, and there's loads of these plugins, and you know of. You go to the website and there's absolutely no information about the company who's behind it 
And I'm yeah, I myself, think do I really want to install this on somebody? It's it's important that we do our due diligence, right? We and we can't guarantee something will be around, but if we're going to invest some amount of money in a project we work on, we need to do our due diligence and make sure that the people are uh, on the straight and, and narrow path. What do you reckon about this one, Chris? The way they just freaking disappeared? It's not my style, but I do think that all <laughs> businesses have a life cycle. You're and so that, well and it, the rate at which businesses grow and die mm. is accelerating, especially in tech. Um, and, and really, I think what's needed here is some education in the consumer space about how to pick and evaluate software because it's either growing, it's stable, or it's dying. It, it really falls into those three buckets. And to, the, to people who aren't used to like doing their diligence and choosing their software tools, you got to look at the support. You got to look at the release velocity. You got to look at the team behind the project. You got to look at their track record. Um, and there's all kinds of quick kind of gut checks you can do to evaluate a product. Um, but both the do-it-yourselfers and the people that serve businesses or um, just customers with website services and stuff, keeping that quality high is, is really important. I mean, Jigo Shop has been on the decline for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I, I've been aware of that for a long time. And I'm a, I've been using WooCommerce for a long time. And when you see a fork happen like that, which doesn't happen all that often in WordPress, but that's one of the freedoms to distribute modified versions to others um when you see that happen you got to see what happens to the old where it came from because it's it's likely going to be on the decline or it's going to become a completely different product but it's important to just kind of know the full story so yeah well you reckon for, for the record uh for the record jigo shop has like uh 400 plus active installs according to the the, mm. the plugin repo so and WooCommerce has like 600,000 or a million. I don't know. Yeah, they're like the number one. Are they the number one e-commerce platform? It's, uh, like it's the most currently recent? sitting at 4 million. 4 million. 4 million. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> so what do you reckon, John? You know, I'm always, you know, especially if somebody's making money from the website, they want you to install some plugin, and you, you go to the website and it's on the about site, there's some verbiage there's absolutely no information not even where they're based their history freaking nothing you know alarm bells start ringing in my head a bit what do you reckon john yeah i mean you can't install plugins if if you don't know who's behind it or who's gonna help support it if there's no uh, clear path to getting support if there's a problem then then you probably don't want to build that into your site or anybody else's site. I think the the Jigo Shop story and how WooCommerce, you know, forked it and and became more popular is really uh, a story about successful branding and marketing. Uh, WooCommerce not only is you know technologically, you know, evolved from Jigo Shop, but also you know they marketed themselves in a way that they became a popular choice. So I, I think that's half the battle too. It's not just having a, uh, a good product because there's a lot of good products out there that are e-commerce or page builders or uh, drag and drop platforms, whatever it is. But it's whoever you know, markets themselves better and, and brands themselves as the clear choice is going to win in the long run. Right. We're going to go for our break and we're going to be coming back. We've got some more stories. Be back in a few moments. We're coming back. I feel we've, had, we've had some bloody stories of the first half. God, my God. Oh, on to the next one. This is going to be interesting. I'm going to make myself really popular here. Diversity, inequality, prejudice, so psychological expo exploration by Yoast.com. I just want to, before I open this out to the panel, I've got, I've got my own thoughts about this. I really think this is a really cynical article done in the worst taste, really. Um, she's been on the show. She came on the show. She's the CEO. She's the wife of um, the founder, Yoast. And all I've got to say, um, I'm not taking any lessons from a company that's former CEO 
at best has got some dicey taste in the people that he mixes with. I'm just not going to put up with this kind of bullshit. And the cynical reason why they wrote this freaking article, which is rather tedious, to be quite truthful. So I'm just opening myself. Sally, what did you think? All right. So I recommended this article for um, a couple of reasons. One is, you know, I, I, I get this you know, email newsletter from Yoast. And they said, hey, we did this, you know, we did this article as a, you know, kind of demonstration of, of using Gutenberg. So some of it is, you know, I think it's well done in terms of its, its layout. Mind you, you know, Gutenberg is not going to create all those cute little animations that are, that are in it. You know, you got to pay somebody for that. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's well laid out. The information is sound information it's not like wildly original or interesting uh, necessarily i mean if, if you've followed any of this you you know you're familiar with all of it um the issue about uh whether uh, you know yoast.com is a is a place that you know is in ha, has any right to publish such a thing i think, I think they need to sort out their own problems before they well, start they publishing they, well, there, there are a couple of points here jonathan one is um, not everyone in a company is going to have the exact same position on everything. Um, and uh, they're not claiming in the article that, you know, they have an amazingly like diverse and enlightened workforce and that their policy is, is doing it, you know, is do, to do anything that would help uh, to, you know, eliminate prejudice and et cetera and so on. Um, You know, she's kind of talking about how these things happen and how some of them think. Now, um, I am fairly certain um, that at some point in your histories, all of you have made, you know, a sexist remark or two, um, uh, maybe done some, behaved uh, in, in some ways that, you know, now you think, yeah, I was kind of an asshole. Um, because, you know, most of us do these kinds of things as we grow up and we hope that we learn better and, and grow out of them. But also, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, my spouse has certainly been known to make a few uh, remarks or, uh, you know, say a few things that I object to. And he has, a, he has a habit that disturbs me of where, you know, if somebody pisses him off, uh, he doesn't just say, you know, that person said an idiotic thing. And, it, you know, it's always that whatever characterizing, you know, they is the, the person's race or their nationality or their gender or their and it, which which like has nothing to do with whatever it is that they did to piss him off um and it annoys me that he does this he's not likely going to stop doing it and you know i am not going to divorce him over it so uh, it's perfectly legitimate that marika could have uh, a very different perspective on these things than her husband has um <clears throat> yeah i'll give you that but to a degree but i've yeah, what do you reckon, John? <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, definitely, I read this article, and I think there's a lot of good points in here. Um, I, I do think that that I, I'm assuming that Marika was was behind, you know, it, it said so in the email that you yeah. wrote it. Okay, but yeah, there's a lot of good points here, you know, especially when it comes to kind of, um, you know, like gender roles and stuff like that. And I, I, for whatever reason, I thought of um, this thing that I saw the other day where it was uh, the, the diaper bags and, and stuff that are camo and uh, you know, the, the uh, all the, the baby, you know, carry your baby around accessories that are camo for the men that, because, you know, we don't want anybody to think that you're not manly with your own kids. And, and, you know, God forbid that, that we think you're a homo or something for taking care of your own children. And that's what it made me think of. Um, you know, so maybe, maybe this is writing the wrongs, you know, I know in the past, um, that, you know, uh, another person that, that they're closely associated with, uh, Marcus Tandler from Wright, which is integrated in Yoast. He hosts this thing, the SEO Oktoberfest. This is the whole thing that, that last year. Um, and I thought about the gender roles and it's like, okay, so they did for many, many years. I don't know if they're still doing it, but for many years, they would hire uh, this lady, Anna, who was a, a German playmate and her a crew of playmates to be entertainment for the SEO Oktoberfest. And I thought about this. How come they didn't hire Chippendale dancers or, or Magic Mike for these things? There's women that go to this event. 
Why, why is this not equal opportunity? So, you know, I, I, I understand this. There are a lot of, like, things that, that are prejudices and... I'm looking that, forward to the next Yo's conference. Uh, you know, I, know. I think, you know, that's you all know, I'm going to say. Equal you opportunity know. for the ladies. I, I think there's a lot of good points in this article. I'm not trying to take away from anything that, that, that Yoast or Marika is doing here. Well, I do. Uh, I just think, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more extreme just, than the rest. I, I think it's rather cynical. What do you reckon, Chris? Am I, am I being unjustified? Because I just think it's really a rather cynical attempt to overcome some serious criticism of Yost and his taste, basically. Well, I think they're talking about it because they're, you know, it's on the, it's on the, the mind of the public or whatever. But I actually really like the article and I think it's, the concept of stereotypes and prejudice when it comes to gender, race, and class is a good thing to have um, just out in the open and give people public conversations and discourse and tools. Because once you, there's a thing about the human brain that it likes, if you were to actually like perceive the reality without all your mental models and shortcuts in place, it would literally be overwhelming. So the human mind operates and looks for patterns. It's lazy. It wants to, so it puts a label on something and it's also designed for survival of the species. So, you know, it'll quickly go to the negative and identify this looks, this pattern looks like a threat, this type of person, this type of whatever threat, threat, threat. That's where the brain is going to go. And that's just natural human instinct. And it's also, um, there's a tribal component to human, uh, sociology and, um, how how humans operate in groups where people feel safest with people. Where you going with this, Chris? Where are you going with this, mate? Where, where I'm going is uh, we live in a different world now than the uh, tribal societies, and our our, our human um, uh, consciousness and stuff has not evolved that much in the past two thousand years. But our culture and our technology and our systems and everything have. So. I think it's really important for people to have these conversations around gender, race, and class and get it out in the open. I think it's important to have just public conversation. All right. Fair enough. What do you reckon, Joe? Do you think I'm just a cynical old man? Oh, uh, man. Uh, well, let's see. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this article. I know that there are prejudices and stereotypes, and we all, all There's of us, There's many people no matter, that don't like English people, aren't there? Right, I don't, like, know, I I don't mean, know why, no, but... Well, like, no we matter, all carry stereotypes look, in our brains. Yeah, no we matter do. who we are, right? Uh, I have been told my opinion doesn't matter because I'm a straight white male. Uh, and I come from a place of privilege. Is that true? I don't know. Maybe. Um, I feel so but, privileged every day. Do, do you, do you get I'm, asked for an ID when you buy something with a credit card? <laughs> uh, no. Sometimes. I say I write CID on my credit card. Uh, I use Apple Pay. Maybe that's a place of privilege. My point is that uh, I'm a little bit... I'm not really sure what I can and can't say here. And I keep drawing a parallel to... Other Say things. whatever you want, Joe. Yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> I you keep, know, Jonathan's already said it, so you're yeah. unlikely to well, offend anyone more than he it, did. I keep trying a parallel to stories earlier this week and last week. He wants to grow a couple. The, he wants to grow some yeah. bull. Instead of, getting they, his, instead of getting his wife to do the dirty work, he wants to freaking <laughs> do it himself. He wants to grow a couple of bull look, himself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't I keep, think that, that Yost is in a position to speak about this mm. at present. I keep trying a parallel. He says nothing. To, he, won't, he won't come on his show. He got his wife to come on, though. Yeah. He wants to grow a couple of balls. That's what he wants to do. I, I think so. So I'm like sitting between Jonathan and Adrian here in this Zoom call, and I feel like that you guys have been wronged personally by people in these stories that we're covering. I'm the 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 point that the thing that I keep coming back to is the cancel culture that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, right? Um, the guy lost his job from SNL for saying things a long time ago uh, that SNL themselves have made jokes of. Uh, the guy from Iowa who got canceled because when he was 16 he tweeted dumb things, um, even though he raised a million over a million dollars for a children's hospital because he said things when he was 16, cancel him. So uh, I just keep thinking of that when I read this, and I don't know why that's the connection I'm making in my brain, uh, but there are stereotypes, there are prejudices. If I, if, if I make one and somebody tells me, hey, don't say that, 
I'll, I will gladly oblige, but I don't want people thinking I'm a terrible person because I said something 10 years ago. I was an idiot 10 years ago and 10 years from now, I'm going to think I'm an idiot from today. So, um, and in general, I just think we need to be a little bit more forgiving. Like Chris said, have these conversations, but, uh, I don't think, I don't, I, it's troubling to me that we assume malice all the time forever. Yeah. To, well. to condemn some, I mean, we all do stupid things and yeah. say stupid things and, uh, uh hurt people and i think really it's yeah you need to give people an opportunity to I'll change feel, 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 to, to make key. restitution to to improve what they've done and yeah, but the key, we I don't like, tend to culturally i think the reason that it's all kicked off was that they they when they did this their first yoast conference or their second one whatever they had all this thing about equal and then it all came out about Oh, Yossi's real background and some yeah. of his real tastes. Right. You know, and do people, you know? What? People just thought it was rather all a little bit really hypocritical. The whole do you thing. know what my takeaway was from that? I deleted any tweet from before 2016. That's that was my only takeaway. I don't know what I said in 2007 when I got on Twitter, but I'm sure somebody somewhere will be offended by it. And if I ever escalate to any level of prominence that's going to be the thing that comes back to right, so. I, I want no hold on one second and 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 i want to say this you know and and this is just to whoever's listening or whoever whoever um joe you spoke about something that that i i know what you're talking about like with the the guy from iowa and and i'll just say this and uh i grew up in a town where there was mostly white people. I mean, there's some Hispanic people. There's not a lot of black people. And it was very common for people to make jokes using the N-word or, you know, um, uh, using slurs for gay people or Hispanic people. But there was no consequences because, again, there's not a lot of, you know, black people in the town. It wasn't like an equal mix. So people didn't face consequences for that. But, you know, as I grew up and I was ex exposed to like different things in the, in the world, I realized that, you know, it's, it's probably not good if me as a white person uses the N word or, you know, the other slurs on people because those people are just trying to make it through the world too. And it, it's kind of hurtful to, to do that. And it just feeds into this whole cycle of, uh, you know, looking at other people like they're you know, inferior or, or looking at people like, the, you know, we should hate them because they're different. So I don't use those words. And I, and like I said, you know, I, I used them when I was young, but I was young and stupid, but you know, it's a different world with social media now. And, and, you know, if you're in the public eye at all, you really do need to be aware of that stuff. But even if you're not in the public eye, even if you're just a person uh, that, that just, Joe person or Jane person, you need to be aware that those things have an effect. So, right. I mean, it's a darn good thing they didn't have something like Facebook when we were young. Mm. I don't know because I, I just don't, you know, I, I'm a I've done stuff that I certainly won't want the rest of you to know about. Nothing really terrible, but just bad taste. But I can tell you, I think and this was really, I don't know, I just don't think I would bun stuff like other people buns on them public platforms even when i was a younger guy i don't know well, I, would, I would like to think that that if i had understood that this was like public and forever i would not be talking about it in those places but you know can you necessarily avoid um you know somebody else getting a picture of you doing the stupid thing while you were intoxicated uh, yeah right um on to the next story Oh, God, another one. Boston Dyke spot leaving the laboratory. What did you think of this, Uncle Spencer? First of all, now I'm going to have to spend my whole weekend deleting all references to the show so that in 2030 I don't have to come back and worry about everything I've said. <laughs> when Matt and Otto... Otto's are, coming after you, Spencer. When Otto shows up at the hospital where the doctors are deciding whether to unplug me and Otto's like, <laughs> now's my revenge. <laughs> Okay, the thing is, I like The Verge. First of all, I just want to say to anybody who's interested in ever actually doing real like reading on a website anymore, which seems weird to say that, but there used to be a time when I used to love to find new web articles and now it's like just exhausting. But I am always surprised in a pleasant way with the reporting from The Verge. And I don't think they shove any weird, like give us 50 cents to read this kind of thing down your throat. But 
I like the video of the guy with the future killer of all of us, the little yellow dog, because this is basically how SoftBank, i.e. Google Ventures, i.e. the overlords are getting in through the little doggy that we're all gonna wanna have that's available for the cost of leasing an automobile today for those who know how to get it. Because the way he interacts with the dog is very disarming. Like unlike the, the, the Boston Dynamics videos where they're beating the robot or the parkour robot, which you know is gonna actually you know, kill you in your sleep. The little doggy is disarming. And then the guy talks about it like he's talking about a Labradoodle. But at some point in the video, which they remarked in their own comment, He's like, the dog looks at me like just an object too big to step on, which is sort of telling of the future because this is the same dog. Lovely, that, lovely. This is the dog that has an accessory arm that can open doors. Yeah, and but that, isn't, isn't the, the reason, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, but you, as you pointed out, it's linked to, you know, story two, you know, the same. But I thought a key part of it said, yes, we released it. But it's mostly radioed, controlled by our no, operator. It's the, no, it's he, not. He said it yeah. in the video. He said he can, he, he can do no. six spins, but the rest of it is radio operated. No, he said the opposite. He said the, the words he used were, quote, unquote, something like, this seems surprisingly detached from what I experienced with a drone or a radio control car. Because even though he's using the remote, the dog still is independent. It does what it wants to do. And all I'm saying is, this is just like their way to get it in the market. But he specifically also referenced, the company has assured us- The that dog not, does not want to do anything. The dog not, has been programmed to behave in certain ways. Saying, he said, the company told him, the company assured us they're not gonna sell this to anybody who weaponizes it. That's quote unquote what was in the video. <laughs> That's so, you know, that's so reassuring. That's right. Dog, this this dog, knife will never be used to stab a human being. The dog, dog is can arm. use so, so, so freaking reassuring. Come I mean, on, the dog has an arm. The dog <laughs> can fire a gun. The dog can climb walls. I mean, it's just, what is going on here? Because some freaking, some, some young hacker like Adrian probably, what, what did you reckon about this, Adrian? Sorry, token young person. Um, the future is now. <laughs> it's a pretty cool dog. <laughs> movies are, action movies are going to be a whole lot cooler. You're going to get, get, get some nice up close. So blase close. about this, aren't you? You're going to get some cool chase scenes. You know, I, the the whole the whole. Uh, <laughs> action sequence is gonna is gonna get a one up from from this i won't be around but you just don't seem to care that you're gonna be exterminated by a yellow dog-like creature you that's kind of cute to... they won't they won't exterminate us and un, until they are uh, capable of building and repairing the, and replacing themselves uh, they, they'll keep us as servants instead elon uh, musk quoted some other thing which is unrelated to this directly but he said something the difference between the danger of ai and people like pol politicians is politicians grow old and die. Whereas an AI overlord, when it's enabled with mechanical devices, will not die. So what happens is if there are enough of these mechanical devices, it literally is science fiction where the AI overlord that goes like some of our political leaders off on a, you know, a bender decides that it's going to fulfill its political agenda. And now it does become this war of the carbon-based versus the... I just want to close Boston Dynamic, and I certainly want to put my boot up spots backside. Well, um, Chris, <laughs> my dear friend Chris, yeah. Mr. I, Mr. I, Reasonable. The, the, the Mr. genie Sims. is out of the bottle. You know, where, you know, if where, it can be done, someone else will, will be able oh, to replicate it. Why do I feel that, I, Chris, why do I feel that I want to put my boot at the backside of Spot the dog? I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out how to use it for marketing. But <laughs> um, <laughs> Ani DeFranco, the singer-songwriter, said every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. And I do like the quote they have here, which is, we don't want to see Spot doing anything that harms people, even in a simulated way. I think that would make Morton happy. That means there is some ethical consideration here. But uh, I mean, clearly this kind of technology may already be available to the military. I mean, who knows how the military uses drones and whatnot. Like you can weaponize Twitter. Well, they they so, use it to kill people, don't they? 
Yeah, but um, but it's it, not it called really, killing; it's called collateral damage, isn't it? The problem is the singularity when that when it becomes you know when the technology can re- recreate itself and make its own decisions outside of human control. That is the problem. The fact oh, that I thought, I'm sure I thought, a toy I or a tool say. is not the problem. It's the consciousness I'm... of the machine. Right. In Star Wars, all the C-3PO and the droids all have that little like device that you know they had the, the kill like, switch uh, restraining bolt. Restraining bolt, like the, the, <laughs> we need a restraining bolt. Essentially, I think there's a few people who think I need a restraining bolt. No, no. I mean, <laughs> what nah, do you reckon? You're beyond hope. All oh, right, that's true. I pass it on. Oh, no. Joe, um, oh, Sally knows me so well. Um, Joe, Joe what, what what was your feelings when you watched this? Well, uh, this reminded me of two videos. One was a robot that Disney is working on. Uh, I feel like I'm like the resident Disney nerd here, but they're working on a robot that's very similar that can perform stunts that then they can use in their live shows and possibly live action movies, right? So these robots could uh, replace people and and make sure people don't get hurt, but still perform those practical effects that we all know and love. The other was uh, this, this robot arm that was supposed to warm up a bottle and then give it to a baby, and it ends up like just punching the baby. Um, a doll, not a real baby, uh, like a doll. Uh, and I'm like, we, if this is where like, our AI robot technology is in general, then probably we're good. Um, and I'll just, I'll just end on this note, um, because you know, we talk about how like, drones, the US military use, uses drones to kill people. They also use robots to keep our armed forces out of harm's way by using robots to defuse bombs and things like that. So uh, always good with the bad uh, until, I mean, it'll be too late by this point, but until I see real proof that the robots are gonna rise up against us, uh, then I'll, I'm, I'm on board with it. I'm a technophile. Oh, well, there we go. We're going to drop I suppose some of us are old and, and can hope that we will be gone <laughs> by that time. But. Right, I'm going to put story six. I'm going to put that in next week's show. Let's go on to our recommendations of the week. Um, let's start with Chris. And do, panel, please put them into chat, all your recommendations. So, Chris, have you got a rec? Well, let's start with mine. Yeah, let's start with mine. Uh, um, I've got a thing from Uncanny Owl that I've been using on a client's website. And it's called Groups. And I know Chris is coming out, him and his um, beloved co-founder who never leaves his cat, his uh, basement. Well, Chris doesn't allow him out, actually. Uh, um, they're going to be producing their own plugin called Groups. But uh, Honey Owl is actually kind of competitor to me in some ways, but they produce this rather really nice um, add-on for Learn Dash that enables you to do groups in the way that it should be done. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure Uncle Spencer say, "Woocommons." Anyway, uh, um, so um, I'm going to start with Chris. Chris, have you got something you want to share with the listeners and viewers? Yeah, if you're listening to this and you're uh, kind of new to WordPress or really want to make sure you know your way around all of it. I wanted to recommend a WordPress training site called WP 101. Mm. Uh, They just turned 11 years old, which is quite an accomplishment um, as a, as a company and uh, just their commitment to serving the WordPress community, keeping their content current, current, working with other great course creators like Joe on this call. Um, Yeah. That's my tip for today. Go check out WP 101, which is made by a great guy named Sean Hesketh. All right. Uncle Spencer, have you got anything you want to share with the listeners and viewers? Yeah, I, I will second that. Sean's a great guy. He's been around since the early days. I remember when he first started that, so it's been a great thing. Um, I want to recommend something that's weirdly p- positioned between email and Slack. It's called Twist, and it essentially is a way to fix the problems of Slack but it doesn't do email stuff. It essentially allows you to create these channels where all the various things you're talking about in a Slack-like environment can be focused upon and then researched and found again and so forth. So it's really good if you're, or worth considering, if you're doing client work and the clients are able to log into something like a Slack, if you put them into something like a twist, you might get a better experience because a lot of the problems with Slack are that once people are in there, they just can run amok, you know, and talk amongst themselves. And it's hard to find stuff after, you know, a while. I have to look at that because it's, yeah, finding something that's the right balance 
Yes, don't forget you... to put the link in. Mm, I put it in the chat already. Mm, yes, please do that. Uh, I'm not uh, seeing it. All right, go. Um, John, have you got anything that you want to share with the listeners and viewers? Yeah, um, I'm sharing an article from Jason Resnick on how to start freelancing. I know a lot of people, uh, especially in the WordPress community, they uh, need help with that, or either maybe they were thinking about leaving like their day job and, and busting out and, and becoming a freelance and going out on their own. This is a good place to start. Uh, read this article. Jason also has a program called Feast, uh, basically uh, group accountability and, and coaching for that. So definitely start here and then go check that out. Yeah, great guy. He came on the WP Tonic yeah. show for an interview a couple of weeks ago. Adrian did a great job interviewing him. You know, I, I'm not sure about my contribution, but there we go. Um, so, <laughs> Sally, uh, um, got anything you want to recommend to the listeners and viewers? Right. So I uh, not and not having been here last week, I don't know what people talked about, but um, uh, the sort of notable item uh, I've come across recently is called Descript. It is a tool for podcasters that basically lets you edit your audio by typing. And if you like make a correction to something you said, it will synthesize your voice to replace it. All right. I just tried that today too. And a great one. Really cool. And so, yeah, it is fascinating and, you know, potentially a little frightening right now. It says it will only like synthesize your voice, but um, there's really, you know, not, not anything to uh, prevent Deep. tools like that from making people say whatever yeah. you want them to say, which has already been in the news as a, you know, as an issue. Uh, but if, if you are, uh, if you are a legit podcaster, it can be very helpful. Mm. Adrian, have you got anything you want to share with the system views? Yeah, uh, we got a we got a uh, integration request a while ago uh, for ThriveCart, and uh, I knew that ThriveCart's been around. And for anybody who's not familiar, ThriveCart is not an open source tool, but it is a software as a service platform, which I'm not you I don't usually recommend, but it's actually pretty nifty. Uh, they have an LTD going on right now, and it's basically they they build uh, your checkout pretty seamlessly. You just throw in, you know, from their templates, their styling elements, and you basically have a checkout that does the whole subscriptions. It does one-time payments. It does shipping. It does drop shipping. It does pretty much all of the things that you'd want. Uh, it's got your one-time payment lifetime dealer right now, and we built an integration for it for Groundhogs. If you want to use it and couple with some CRMs, marketing automation, you can do that as well. So my recommendation is Thrivecart. I think it's like $500 is LTD right now. So you can go pick that up before they actually start charging monthly. Although their LTD, to be fair, has been going on for like a year and a half. So Seems to be going forever, doesn't it? <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know if that'll end anytime soon, but yeah, you can go check that out. Right. And Joe, Joe, got anything you want to recommend to listeners and viewers? Yeah, so recently my uh, Evernote subscription ran out. I let it run out because I didn't feel I was getting the value to pay like 70 bucks a year for it or whatever. So I was looking for a replacement and I came across Keep It, which is an iOS and Mac app uh, that is decidedly cheaper. If you're only using it on iOS, it's $10 a year. Um, but I've been using it for some research projects and keeping notes about uh, like fitness things and stuff like that. And I've been really enjoying it. That's some great recommendations. I'm very impressed, Spadal. Uh, um, we're going to end the show now, folks. If you want to support the show, go to iTunes and give us a review. If if you're a female and you want to come, you're, you're involved in the WordPress community and you want to share some thoughts with the rest of the community, please consider coming on the show and go to the WP Tonic website send me a message with the contact us page and we can have a chat and have you on the show we'd love you to join and um, we'll be back next week where we'll have reason and insight from the panel you'll have dribble and self-promotion from me uh, um, we'll see you next week folks bye bye <laughs>